my extra thanks to Oliver, who's been uh, very good at uh, keeping us on time and on schedule, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> we tried our best, so thanks so much. Um, okay, so um, what's new in this uh, report? So we started out from uh, an annual review of economics piece, and we took out sort of some, some elements of it. We, we, we kept it a bit tighter and uh, took out a sort of framework along which we can classify the papers, sort of introduce a taxonomy, and we updated it to reflect sort of new developments. So um, if you're interested in sort of a bit more background, uh, you, you know, that uh, review is also uh, quite complementary to this one. So this piece will be a bit more dynamic. So we expect to update it uh, regularly. So hopefully, uh, uh, you know, the pace of this field of work will uh, increase even more. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep you updated. The focus is on evidence from developing countries, but we're also going to draw on historical and contemporary developed countries setting evidence in this review uh, whenever the evidence is scarcer. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize sort of in broad strokes uh, what this Vox DevLit covers and then allow uh, 20 minutes or have 20 minutes time for a Q&A. Uh, any questions and suggestions you might have for, uh, uh, for the next uh, revision of this uh, review. Okay. And so again, how is this report structured? Um, so we have a sort of brief introduction, so I'll go through that. But the main sort of piece that uh, we use a taxonomy to classify sort of the elements of uh, public sector performance is to sort of go on the individual level and think about these three elements. So one is how to motivate people, right? Incentives. Uh, two, how to recruit people, how to screen and select uh, high-performing uh, workers in the public sector and then for that sort of a bit of a residual uh, and we'll talk about that a bit more as sort of the organizational aspects the role of matching talent to jobs uh, training building human capital and designing tasks uh, in a way to uh, make the process more efficient and then ultimately i'll conclude with uh, some some sort of uh, uh, takeaways that we felt and highlight some areas where future work might be uh, uh, very uh, fruitful. Okay, so uh, just in terms of introduction, why are we interested in these people you see here, right? Uh, I, I told Oliver, I was like, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if not, no one shows up when it's about bureaucracy. But I think one thing that's really exciting about studying bureaucrats is that it really gives us a micro perspective on something that the broader literature and development has highlighted for a long time that institutions are important and that state capacity and government effectiveness are really critical for building an environment conducive to development and growth. And so what's nice about bureaucracy is that uh, once we zoom into one sort of organization, uh, we can sort of unbundle the different components of performance and think about different policies at a sort of very granular level at which we can sort of uh, improve uh, state capacity, right? So this is just giving you sort of a macro cross-sectional uh, motivation, right? Showing the average bureaucracy score uh, computed using the VDAM um, and, uh, and showing that there's a, in general a positive correlation uh, between uh, 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 GDP per capita income and, uh, and the quality of the bureaucracy. Now, of course, this is a cross-sectional and a cross-country evidence. So it's just meant to highlight sort of one reason why you might care about it and what we're going to do in this report is zoom in mostly into uh, micro level more identified work based on experimental data experiments, for example. Um, so why do bureaucrats matter? Um, again, a reason, a key reason why they matter is that they're sort of between what politicians, politicians do and choose in terms of policy and what ultimately uh, gets implemented affects the people on the ground, right? So in a way, if you look at this diagram, you can think of, of uh, these, uh, the bureaucracy being the middle part, right? That, that translates policy choices uh, that are made based on uh, choices of the voters, based on choices of politicians, uh, and, and translates this into, for example, public good delivery, right? And so uh, just to be precise, we think of uh, bureaucrats here as professionals in public employment who provide key inputs and decision-making that can impact uh, the quality of a service delivery and the functioning of the state. Uh, 
right? So uh, that's still a very broad definition of bureaucrats. So what we wanted to do is to sort of uh, zero in a little bit more about on that. So the, the sort of there's sort of two types of bureaucrats you can think of. One is really the, the classic bureaucrats you might imagine, these people sitting at the desk and processing pieces of paper. So these are sort of the senior and junior bureaucrats. But then there's also quite a bit of work that we identified that focuses on what you would call frontline providers, right? Or street level bureaucrats, people that are public employees and providing education and health. So teachers, nurses, and doctors. So at times we'll also draw upon uh, evidence from these frontline providers. Um, and I'll, I'll be more specific about why this is particularly the case. Um, another thing that's important here to highlight just uh, as an introduction is that there's quite a bit, of, it's a clear distinction between politicians and bureaucrats. And so we really focus on uh, that administrative state and not the sort of political dimension in this case, right? And, and so uh, there are clear reasons we briefly highlight why this is different, right? So you can think about uh, politicians really being accountable, not directly to the voters as some politicians are, uh, but uh, accountable to their supervisors, right? And, and those are typically the politicians. So they are asked to implement what they're told to do. And another thing that will come out being very important is the fact that the time horizon is also very different, right? So, uh, so politicians typically are subject to sort of electoral cycles, right? They care about uh, being reelected. Bureaucrats have often given their lifelong service a very different type of career incentives. And, and these might also be levers that uh, uh, one can use in the public sector to increase performance to greater, greater motivation. Okay, so um, then we can sort of go in right into the different building blocks of bureaucrat performance. So as I mentioned, there are uh, sort of three groups, uh, broadly speaking. One is incentives, then there's selection, and then sort of organizational design, right? Matching and uh, training and task design. Um, so we first focus on incentives. Um, that's uh, for, for various reasons. So first of all, it's, it's especially important in the public sector where, again, as I mentioned, tenures are very long, right? So people uh, at any time are already selected into the public sector. And there's very little firing typically. So policymakers often have to work with whoever is around. So then the question is, well, okay, how do we, do we uh, incentivize people that are already serving to, to perform well, right? And so um, it's especially important in the public sector, but, but yet in our review, we found that this is still incentive systems are rarely used in the public sector. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about why this might be the case. Um, but what is interesting is that there is quite a bit of a toolkit under which you can study incentives. So for example, we have the classic principal agent framework, right, with, with, with sort of a supervisor and an employee and the supervisor trying to incentivize the subordinate. So there's a rich literature in the private sector setting. But when we try to look into the public sector setting, we noted that there's sort of some departures and differences that might make it harder to sort of translate the lessons one to one. And so I'm going to highlight uh, two main issues uh, that came up. One is the measurement of performance. And then second, some institutional differences uh, between public versus private sector setting that make the public sector setting a little bit more rigid. Um, so first of all, when we think about the objective function of bureaucrats, when we think about incentives, we need to think about, well, what, what are they supposed to do, right? And so the simplified view is, again, uh, they, they do as they are told. Uh, they, are, uh, they are subordinate to politicians at times and, and they implement policy choices imposed by others. But in reality, there's a large literature that highlights the role of incomplete contracts. So it's very difficult to actually tell people what to do exactly because politicians might often not know. Right? So politicians might have the big picture, but they're not uh, uh, technical uh, folks, so they don't know the details. And that gives uh, bureaucrats quite a bit of discretion in how to implement things. And, and uh, that can sort of introduce at times a tension where bureaucrats might not want to implement what politicians want, 
or they might have their own perspectives on how to better implement things and, and for example, slow down, slow down certain processes, right? So that's typically sort of the, what we call the delegation problem here. Yeah, bureaucrats have more expertise, but they can also ex abuse their discretion because the principal does not really know exactly all the details. Now, conceptually, it's also very hard to sort of think about what the objective function of a bureaucrat might be, right? So in other settings, it's often easier, right? If we think about politicians, they maximize re-election probability, firms might maximize profits, CEOs might maximize shareholder value. But what exactly it is that uh, bureaucrats are doing is, is sort of at times very difficult. And I think this is a fundamental question that uh, a lot of studies sort of have to tackle first in order to move towards measurement of outcomes, right? And so uh, it's often very difficult to think about how to measure performance, which is critical if you want to incentivize people based on the output they're creating, right? So some examples then, if we look at frontline providers, these street level bureaucrats, it's much easier. We, we find papers using test scores, vaccinations, in-home in visits, things that are clearly measurable and that can be mapped into individuals. Um, but when we look at sort of senior and junior level bureaucrats, it's really difficult, right? For example, are we going to use number of meetings attended, proposals written, adherence to rules? So these things are very hard to interpret potentially as performance. And this is a key empirical challenge in the study of bureaucrats, where I think uh, more work uh, is certainly needed. Um, because of that reason, I think uh, this, this difficulty of measuring performance uh, there has been historically uh, a lot more skepticism towards the use of incentives in the sort of literature uh, 20, 20, 30 years ago. Um, uh, other issues in addition that uh, I will discuss are, for example, multitasking, right? Bureaucrats do very complex tasks, so, so they might, uh, if you set the incentives wrong, they might actually uh, neglect other dimensions that are critical for the implementation of a policy just because you're measuring and rewarding them privately on certain dimensions that you can easily observe. So that's the multitasking problem. Bureaucrats often work in teams, so there's a joint production problem. It's very hard to, to sort of attribute uh, the output that happens perhaps at the departmental level, for example, to, to contributions of each individual. And uh, subjective biases might arise in settings where we rely on uh, ratings, right, scores that uh, are internally provided in the bureaucracy. There are also other issues that are discussed. For example, if we pay too much incentive uh, pay, performance pay, you might completely alter the type of people who decide to work in the public sector, right? People might be much more mission driven and, and uh, paying them hard cash for performance might potentially crowd out these type of people that you want in the public sector. So that's a discussion that we also highlight when we talk about selection. Uh, and so um, do incentives work in the public sector then? So what did our review sort of uncover? Um, we find that most of the work, because it's so hard to measure performance, has to sort of trade off by zeroing in on things that can be measured, right? So bureaucrats, focusing on bureaucrats and frontline providers with narrow functions. So when we look at research on frontline providers, for example, people often look at uh, uh, teachers, where you have test scores, attendance, health workers, you have uh, uh, home visits, uh, vaccines administered, and so on. Tax collectors is another one that has been very fruitful uh, in recent years, focusing on uh, the collection of uh, uh, revenue, right, by local tax uh, tax officers. And so uh, these are things that can be measured. And then once we have the measurement in place, we can think about sort of playing around with different incentive structures and see how they affect performance. Um, other narrow bureaucratic tasks for sort of more senior junior type of non frontline providers uh, are procurement officers are very popular, uh, because again, we can measure delays and we can measure cost overruns. And again, narrow, narrowly defined tasks, right? So think about officers processing social security applications, things that are very standardized and where you can measure everything that uh, the bureaucrat sees as well, right? And, and, and sort of have a less ambiguous interpretation of what is high performance. When we look at senior civil servants, it's much harder because uh, again, they, they are not doing very narrow tasks uh, by the senior nature of their seniority. 
So here, one approach has been to use subjective evaluations, right? So sort of 360 evaluations you might have seen in the private sector. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a bit more about sort of potential drawbacks there uh, later on. But that work by and large, using all the sorts of measurements that I discussed, uh, shows that incentives, if they're well calibrated and tailored to the public sector settings, do matter and do, do give you uh, more performance. So, so incentives seem to also work uh, in, the, in the public sector. Now, let me just give you sort of a little case study in terms of, uh, I didn't know exactly how to proceed here, but I wanted to sprinkle in some evidence to give you a flavor of sort of the type of things we zero in and discuss, just to give you an example uh, of using procurement as a measure of performance, right? So uh, this is a, a paper uh, set in uh, Pakistan. And uh, the idea here is that you can look at price variation, you can look at procurement officers and how good they are at procuring the very same good, right? And so if you have two procurement officers and one is able to procure it at a lower price, you can say, well, this person is potentially doing a better job, right? So the key here is to, again, hold constant exactly the task. And so here's just an example showing you the different types of things that people might procure, right? So uh, things are pretty specific, right? Uh, uh, soap, right? And, and even among these very narrow uh, definitions of items, you do see quite a bit of performance differences, price dispersion, right? And so once you have that measurement in place, what you can then do is you can think about uh, changing incentives or the processes in the bureaucracy uh, and look at what it does to the outcome of interest, right? So in this paper, for example, uh, the procurement process is essentially streamlined in a way that uh, certain holdup situations are alleviated. Uh, so the, the, the procurement officer can proceed faster and has more autonomy, doesn't, get, doesn't need to get as much approval uh, as, as in the past. And what this paper does is it, it randomly introduces sort of that, that reform, if you will, and shows that increasing autonomy to these procurement officers by sort of streamlining the process helps reduce uh, procurement prices by 9%, right? So this is just an example of uh, using one way of measuring performance and then finding out, figuring out the variation to, to look at uh, how, how certain things affect bureaucratic performance. So in the paper, we, we have a lot of these type of examples that we use to highlight uh, sort of what we think are sort of very interesting and, and, and novel approaches uh, and so, so you, you're welcome to have a closer look at uh, the review piece uh, if you are more interested in this. Um, I also mentioned constraints in the public sector that exist unlike in the private sector, right? So one thing that, that happens is a public organization typically don't have a, as flexible pay schedules as you might expect in the private sector. Uh, and, and, and so, for example, if you, you know, typically 80% of the variation in, 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 in pay is explained by the job title when you in, in developed countries, for example, right? And so, and this is especially the case, the more senior you go, uh, there is not really performance pay, right? So you might be able to incentivize uh, teachers perhaps a little bit and, and things where you, uh, workers where you can measure performance, but the higher you go, it's, the harder it is to, to, to really use the salary margin to incentivize people. And, and the rigidity is often made worse by the fact that in many bureaucracies, that's a bit of a cliche, but that is really the fact, uh, there is rigidity through a time-based progression, right? Because performance is hard to measure, one thing you can measure well is how long people have stuck around. So uh, in, in uh, some uh, own work also, what we find is that there, there are basically lockstep progressions in, 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 for example, in the Indian bureaucracy uh, that happens, and that makes it very hard to, to motivate people because they know they will be eventually promoted anyway. And there's also a lack of sticks. You cannot really use the threat of firing because in sort of most settings, we now have civil service protections. Um, so um, that has certain benefits, but the downside is you one tool that we use in the private sector to motivate people uh, cannot really be used. Now, one margin you can use to incentivize people, though, is through career incentives, right? So you can still try to give people differential prospects in the promotion, and that can come in different ways, right? It can come in sort of a horizontal way as well, that you ha can have the very same seniority of job, 
but there might be differences in how prestigious a certain placement is versus the other, right? So uh, the, an idea here is that you can use these rotations that happen quite frequently because bureaucrats stick around, right? So you don't hire new people, you just reshuffle people and you can use the reshuffle to motivate people using the fact that some might really want to work at certain places over others. And what's interesting about this is that I think is that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very potentially cheap way to motivate people because the principal per se may not actually care about how you allocate people, but the workers privately might very much care. Right? And so um, one sort of uh, piece we identified in this setting uh, it's a it's a again experimental piece set in uh, Pakistan, and they're again uh, able to overcome the measurement problem by zeroing in on tax collectors, right? So these are uh, people working in uh, Punjab's uh, revenue circles uh, to collect uh, taxes. So you can use uh, tax uh, tax revenue generated as a measure of performance. And what they do is they solicit at baseline the preferences of where people want to work. So there are different circles, locations, positions, right? So it's the same job, but you might work in different environments, right? And so they measure which jobs you prefer over others. And based on that, they introduce an experiment where if you perform particularly well, based on these revenue performance measures, you would more likely get your top preference in the assignment next year, right? So this is directly linking what you really care about, the price um, to, to how well you generate revenue in your current job. So it's really trying to get at this uh, career incentives and, and the control group just keeps the allocation at the status quo. And what they find is that introducing that mechanism alone helps increase tax revenue growth uh, by quite a bit, right? So again, what's very interesting is that they have, you have to reallocate people anyway at times, but just figuring out how to do it as a policymaker in a way that that, that leverages these incentives uh, might give you uh, more bang for that. So that's kind of, I think, a sort of very interesting takeaway of these incentives, not necessarily being paying you more, but just exploiting the fact that people might care about and like certain places more, more than others. Um, other issues we discussed when it comes to incentives are multitasking issues, right? So one, one concern here is that because performance is very difficult to measure, um, uh, there, there might also be biases in that assessment. And because of that, activities in the bureaucracy whereby bureaucrats just try to butter up to their bosses, right? Try to uh, engage in influence activities to get high evaluations, but these activities might not help contribute to increasing the organizational performance, right? And so that's important because if there are multitasking concerns, it can really affect the interpretation of empirical results, right? Again, so you might say higher test scores is not a good thing if people are teaching to the test. And, uh, and if revenue extraction comes at the expense of uh, being extremely coercive, uh, then that's not a good thing, right? So um, what we find in the review is that most papers are very careful in addressing this. And so, for example, the paper before I mentioned, they, they would explicitly design an additional treatment arm to, to rule that out and also collect a range of additional outcomes that might be affected by sort of a strategic shift in behavior and, and try to rule out that, uh, that you don't see action on the other dimensions, right? So, so that's one way we've seen people uh, dealing with the, this issue that uh, conceptually is important, but empirically people seem to be able to, to tackle. Um, one interesting piece, again, for buttering to the boss that we found and thought was important, interesting to highlight is that uh, this is a sort of thing that people mention in theory, but the empirics is pretty scarce. And, and there's an interesting experiment that was run in China where uh, basically civil servants have two bosses and they don't exactly know who's going to evaluate them. And, uh, and what, what the treatment does is that it randomizes these people into either knowing who will be the evaluator or not knowing, right? And so what they find is quite interesting in that particular setting, namely that if you are a bureaucrat and you know by chance who's going to be your evaluating supervisor, you end up getting much higher scores from that particular guy vis-a-vis -vis the other supervisor, right? So that's direct evidence 
of this non-productive muttering up to the bosses, these influence activities that people in theory have discussed a lot, right? So there is certainly that concern. And, uh, but again, the, the literature that uh, deals with it tries to sort of just get a more comprehensive uh, view on multiple dimensions of performance in trying to, uh, trying to deal with this. Um, we also look at something that's a sort of new and emerging literature that zeroes in on sort of what makes the public sector perhaps very special. And that it's the fact that people are often not in for the money, but they're in for the good they do, right? They're often, there's an emphasis on the mission of the organization. And again, what's interesting here is that this is potentially a cheap way, if you will, to motivate workers, right? So, so you, you, you're emphasizing the mission of the organization or building a culture that emphasizes the organizational mission uh, it doesn't doesn't mean you're paying people more, right? It's just just trying to build a different culture, and so here uh, we felt that we that the evidence is a little bit uh, sort of uh, smaller that literature, and I think this is really an exciting area. There's one piece we identified, which again zeroes in on frontline providers where you can measure performance, which are these lady health workers in in Pakistan. So you can look at again house visits in-home visits as a measure of performance. And what that paper does is that during a training of these health workers, they, they introduce a treatment that emphasizes the mission of the organization, essentially playing a video of, of the district, I think, health office minister, uh, emphasizing the, that the importance of the task they're doing and the mission of the overall organization versus the other arm gets sort of a placebo baseline training. And what that paper shows is that, yes, this mission emphasis does help to get more out of, uh, out of these workers. Right? So again, and I think it would be interesting to think more about this because this is exactly where uh, the public sector is very different potentially from, uh, from the private sector. Okay, so when it comes to um, selection, then we sort of move to the next part in the review. We then say, okay, so, we held constant the people we have and thought about how to motivate them. The other thing you can do is just choosing the right people in the first place, right? And in a way you might say, this is a more fundamental question uh, because if you select people well, and so that you don't need to monitor them and you don't need to incentivize them, right? And so this opens up this crucial question about what is the right type of people you want to actually have in the organization. And and here, so um, it's quite interesting when we reviewed this literature, there's sort of different, different places where studies have sort of zeroed in, right? And so first of all, when we think about selection, it's sort of a, we call it two-sided market, right? So first you need people to apply, right? People need to want to work for you and then you need to choose them, right? So what this means is that there are sort of two ways to potentially study selection. Uh, and so we had this sort of taxonomy where we said, well, th there are these studies that randomize sort of ways of attracting people, right? So one way to do it is, for example, to randomize job ads, right? Uh, so when you advertise a public sector job, which dimensions do you emphasize? And how does that affect the decision of people to apply? How does it affect the type of people that you attract, right? The second class of studies takes the applicant pool constant uh, as given says, okay, suppose you have those, can we change the way we select from the existing pool of people to pick the right people, right? So, so sort of, so of course it's two things, but they're, they're separating them is sort of gets, allows us to get sort of a, a bit better handle on, on that. And so we found that this literature is, is, is sort of really hard, randomizing selection, because I guess hiring it's just very hard to randomize them, right? So, so uh, most of the work in this space is more observational. And so again, why would people self-select into the public sector? They might care about pecuniary gains, higher pay, stable employment. These are things that are typically mentioned. There's a, a public sector wage premium in most of the countries in the world. And there are also non-pecuniary gains like mission of the organization that, uh, that we highlighted. And so again, where I can't talk through all the papers. It's more just like a, a one, one example for a big class of papers. Uh, this is an example of sort of a, a, a experiment on the 
on the randomizing job ads on the applying application margin, right? So it's trying to uh, uh, trying to uh, randomize the emphasis of what this job entails, right? So here uh, you see one on the left, everything looks the same, except that on the left, you see it's become a community health worker to gain skills and boost your career. So it seems to emphasize the career and private aspects of it, the profession aspect. And the right uh, leaflet is emphasizing the the community aspect, right? To, to the the pro-social serving the, the 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 community aspect, and and so that's relatively straightforward to randomize. You can just sort of randomize advertisement markets and and what you what you show, and then look at how this affects who who decides to apply, right? And what what's interesting is in that particular study, they find that there is this trade-off people have, have discussed about uh, pro-sociality and sort of hard ability measures, um, but that that doesn't apply to in, in that particular setting the margin applicants. So when we look at the people that you would consider, the sort of higher ranked people, on that margin, it is not the case that the better people you select are necessarily less pro-social. So, uh, so that, that sort of, again, a theoretical tension that people have highlighted doesn't seem to to have as much bite in, in, in reality when we look at, at the evidence. Uh, um, the second thing then is about uh, selection, right? Holding constant the pool of people, how do we uh, know how to select people? Now, given the, uh, what we have in the public sector, the main way people are nowadays selecting uh, is to use civil service exams, right? So that's a sort of a, con a cornerstone of many uh, uh, sort of uh, Viberian uh, governments. Uh, and the question there is, well, should we use rules like an exam or rely more on discretion to screen? And here there's, again, a theoretical ambiguity that we found, which is on the one hand, using rules or hard scores that sort of not allowing for biases, but you might be screening on dimensions that are not very predictive for later on the job performance, right? So, so yes, you have something impartial, but maybe exam scores don't really translate into later performance. And here, when we look at the literature, there is quite a bit of work in that space, um, but we had a bit of a harder time to sort of find a sort of a overall takeaway because there's some work that shows that these exams in, in improve performance by changing the selection of people. So there's some historical evidence and there's some evidence from, uh, from hospital settings. Uh, but then there's other studies that are less conclusive at times in very similar industries or settings. Uh, and, and so um, I think more work in that space is needed uh, because this question per se seems also highly heterogeneous, depending on what type of person you, you're going to recruit, right? So, so if you want to recruit a, a community health worker that with rules versus discretion might be very different from recruiting a CEO or a senior level manager. And so um, another thing that is difficult here is that uh, most of the work is observational. So it's very hard to uh, isolate certain elements very, very clearly because reforms typically come in a bundle of things. And, and I guess, you know, in contrast to the stuff we showed you before that sort of more identified, it's just very difficult to convince people to randomize hiring. So I was told there might be people and policymakers who are listening in. So if you, <laughs> this is a dimension, if you're interested in uh, where uh, academically there's a lot of work uh, that, that could be done, I think. Um, okay, so I, I have to wrap up soon. So I'm gonna uh, speed up a little. So the last thing we discuss is really uh, matching. And so uh, our training or task designs really are residual things that go beyond incentives and selection, right? Things that you can do in the organization. And, and so I think uh, theoretically, the key mechanisms that, that, uh, that uh, have been sort of very interesting to explore were, were sort of one, the specialization and assortativeness question, right? Thinking about, should we have generalists? Should we allocate economists to the Ministry of Finance? Or should we, how should we, match people to jobs uh, in a way that makes the best use of their talents. The second class of those questions is about uh, biases that might exist, right? And that's sort of uh, the social proximity type of stories where um, historically, for example, there, there was a concern that you shouldn't have tax collectors work in their home areas because uh, 
they 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 might be easier to uh, to bribe and they might give in to local pressures more, right uh, but on the other hand there's also work that emphasizes the importance of leveraging private information people have in the sense that uh, of course if you are from a home area if you're socially proximate to the area you're serving you might know their preferences more and you might be able to implement things a little bit more effectively so that's again these are always these tensions that you have in theory and and we now have some some evidence that speak to those type of uh, questions and so again what is interesting here i think from a policy perspective is that it's in a way again cheap in the sense that you already have people there and you don't necessarily have to pay a lot more it's just about how you reallocate and make use of the existing pool of talent you have right through re improving performance through better reallocation and so here, uh, just going to close with this, uh, there, there are, again, we discussed the work in that space. There's this very interesting thing, again, looking at tax collectors because you can measure their performance and using the fact in a DRC setting that these tax collection people work in teams and the areas they work in are highly heterogeneous. And so what this does is that there's this random allocation of these people that allows you then to estimate which type of matches between teams and the, where the teams are assigned to are most effective in generating revenue, right? So um, specifically in this setting, there are people you're paired up in two. So you, you can be either sort of high, low, so high, high sort of qualified tax collector and low collective uh, low quality tax collector can pair, be paired together or you you pair the high high quality with a high quality person and the low with the low right so and then you can decide in which areas you assign them to places with high revenue generation capacity and low revenue generation capacity and and what this paper finds is that the, there is actually evidence that assortative uh, allocations uh, are more effective at generating revenue. So specifically in this setting, having uh, having both high type uh, tax collectors being assigned to high type households to generate uh, to to collect taxes gives you a lot more than just a random allocation. So again, if you were not if you were not sure what to do, you might just do it at random or in some some ad hoc way. But if we have this information. On, on how we can, which matches are most effective, we, we can potentially uh, change the policies to get more bang for the buck. Okay, so I'm at 41, so I'm just gonna uh, uh, try to conclude, although I think this is really uh, a work in progress. So this is this wiki nature that I find particularly exciting about these box devlets. So we survey this vibrant literature on bureaucracy and development. I think this is really interesting because it's a, question that is very hard to tackle this sort of how do we increase state capacity because we know it's important for development but now we can zero in on the organizational and personal aspects right and by doing so by looking at the bureaucracy we can contribute to answering this bigger question and so where are we well um in terms of work on incentives there's there's a growing body of work at least in our reading of the literature that shows that both explicit and implicit incentives work when calibrated to the public sector rigidity and constraints that exist, right? So, so just translating it one to one uh, is, is might be more difficult, but so, but they do work. So, I think uh, the skepticism that people had in the past maybe uh, is, has gone a little bit away given the new empirical work that, that that is around. So, on terms of questions of bureaucrat selection, uh, our reading was that that literature is still unexplored. And in particular, it would be nice to have more experimental work that allows us to really get at specific dimensions of selection more carefully. So, for example, you can think about experimentally varying the weights you assign on different methods of screening, right? Uh, interview versus uh, hard test, and you randomize some, uh, the weights uh, and see which, which scheme allows you to select better people. Um, the other thing that uh, we felt is sort of important is the sort of scaling up question in the sense that a lot of the work we find by nature of wanting to identify something very carefully and establishing a causal relationship carefully zeroes in on sort of very specific uh, atomistic treatments, if you will. Um, but of course, organizations uh, are sort of embedded, right? So just to show you the way that the one department works with other departments in lockstep. So 
thinking about how these policy and reforms might interact uh, across uh, the wider bureaucracy, I think, is, is a really important question, but also really hard to answer. Right? And so, so uh, you might think, well, maybe we need to have a broader bundle of policies implemented across different departments for the effects to really materialize. So then studying just how a treatment affects one particular office with everything else at the status quo remaining constant might give you a very sort of different, uh, different effect. And so thinking also about the interaction of the public with the private sector is particularly exciting. I think as, as some of the functions of the state now are also taken over by NGOs and private sector organizations, right? So thinking about sort of the boundary of where the state is, it's also another interesting uh, area of work. And again, one thing we found is that most of the work uh, that's sort of at the front here really colla leverages collaborations with, uh, with government uh, governments and international organizations and it's because study of studying bureaucrats requires you to have data, right? So we need internal administrative data. And this is a space where I think academic and policy interests significantly overlap. And so this is a really fruitful area for collaboration. And we look forward to observing, you know, for and documenting the, the, uh, the progression of this uh, very exciting area of work. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on, uh, on our review and uh, what other work you might find uh, interesting. So I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that incredibly uh, interesting presentation. We've had a couple of questions, um, but if anyone else has anything to uh, ask, now's the time to submit it into the Q&A. Um, we've had one from uh, Raul who asks about whether there are any differences um, in how economics and political science kind of approach the study of um bureaucracy empirically um and yeah whether you have any kind of comments on that yeah so um this is a great question so we've mainly surveyed the economics literature but uh, in fairness the political science literature is much bigger in this space right so this is a space where economists have just come in and discovered if you will that this is an important area to study. Um, we, I think in the report, we also highlight some review chapters in the political science literature. Uh, in general, I think uh, the, the sort of concerns and differences are, where the questions are very similar that are being studied, I believe. I think uh, one difference is that there's more of a um, application of toolkits and models in economics that we have seen from private sector settings to the public sector setting and sort of trying to sort of move, you know, apply these models we know to a setting that we don't know that that's something we don't see in political science because they are just concerned with that question per se. Um, in terms of methods, um, most of the work uh, at the front here in political science uh, is very comparable in terms of empirical standards. Uh, there's lots of randomized controlled trials as well, uh, and and careful measurements. So in a way, that's that's uh, it's a good literature to also follow and track. But we had to keep our survey a little bit tighter, so so it doesn't sort of get out of focus. But I think that's a good question. Right, and then we had one. Uh, from Galia Liu, who asks um, specifically about one of your recent papers, which is on ideological misalignment and how basically when bureaucrats um, and the politicians that they serve kind of don't see eye to eye on politics, how that can affect the performance of the bureaucrats. Um, and he asks about that specifically in developing countries um where there's kind of widespread patronage and that might kind of misalign um that misalignment might kind yeah. of be exacerbated um and yeah he asks about kind of quantifying that in other settings and if that's something you've thought about and what your perspective would be yeah i think that again that's a really good question and um so um that paper, I think that is mentioned here, uh, just so just to make sure we're all on the same page, is, is looking at the modern day US setting and exploiting the fact that civil servants, again, 
stick around. They have civil service protections. So at any point in time, it means that uh, there will be some that disagree maybe politically with who the president is, right? Because they're sticking around and presidents come and go. Um, and we document sort of some performance penalty due to being misaligned that we say is, is a sort of, um, uh, we call it a negative morale effect. Uh, now, I think how, the question is, how do we apply that to a developing country setting? I would say uh, it's a very good question because um, the cost of pay, so it, it's, a, it's a hard question today. So, so I think what we do in our paper is we're showing a potential downside of having civil service protections, which means, yes, you protect people from firing and political influence, but you also cannot solve the misalignment problem. And that's a source of friction that we document in a sort of high income uh, setting. Now, I think uh, when we look at a uh, lower income setting and that, that relates to, again, this heterogeneity that's very important, I think, uh, I think there it might well be the case that having more political insulation is a good thing, right? So, um, uh, because the, the counterfactual of having, solving these misalignment problems would be to have no civil service protections. And uh, there's also some work that shows that civil service protections really are effective in reducing political cycles, in reducing bureaucrat turnover and improving performance. Uh, and, and so I, I would say uh, there are costs and benefits of it. And in low income settings, the, the benefits of civil service protections might be larger than the cost of the political misalignment friction that might be in, introduced. Not sure if I answer that well. <laughs> yeah, well, your answer also kind of links quite closely to another question by Vishu, who um, asked about kind of when there's high reshuffling um, in these settings, can assurance or more assurance over a tenure um, have a positive impact on um, kind of the work of bureaucrats and the overall department? I guess that question specifically talks about higher level bureaucrats who maybe are more exposed to politicians and more at risk of kind of reshuffling. Um, is that something that you've seen kind of evidence on? Um, yeah. I, think, on? I think that's again a great question. I would say, again, there's this interesting trade-off, right? It depends on how much and perhaps there's this sweet spot in the sense that if you fully insulate bureaucrats from political interference or the, the ability of politicians to move you around perhaps, right? Uh, then, uh, then you're not you, you you have no way of holding them to account, right? To to incentivize. If you have too much of it, you might say that's political interference. There are some settings we, in, in today even where we see people being moved every other month, right? And so you might say that's excessive turnover. And so um, there is some work. So there is some work that looks at, for example, in the U.S. in the introduction of civil service protections that shows that this helps dampen these uh, excessive turnover particularly uh, well. And, and it's perhaps in settings where turnover is at baseline really high, where having uh, some protections to reduce those turnover can be very beneficial. I think in the Brazilian setting, Diana has a, uh, has a paper on that, uh, that holds as well. Um, so again, there's a trade-off and I think there's potentially a sort of sweet spot, uh, sort of not too much turnover and some control, but uh, but not uh, not too much that uh, that people can't really learn on the job, and and get uh, uh, discouraged from from investing at all. Great, thanks. Um, we had another question uh, from uh, Nadja who asked about whether you've come across any work or have thoughts on. Um, the production function within an administration, given the differences between the private sector and the public sector. Um, if that's something that you kind of have any thoughts on or, or comments on, if there's been any work on specifically looking up production functions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a great question and that relates to uh, the, the 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 empirical issue that at times an output is a result of lots of inputs coming in, right? And so we observe the final output, but there are all these inputs that fed in and we don't know how to attribute them. So 
having a sort of like a production function estimation, I think, in the public sector seems potentially very interesting. Um, uh, I haven't, I haven't, or we haven't, well, I haven't come across uh, anything in that uh, that flavor. Um, but I think that would be very, very useful if there's a setting where the tasks and the production process is very standardized that would allow you to, to look at that. I mean, there's some work that shows, for example, in the US that argues or documents empirically that uh, Democrats might be better at spending sort of on certain certain uh, uh, certain areas in the public sector, say education, than, than, than Republicans. Uh, but that's a very reduced form sort of statement. It's not really getting at which, you know, are they more productive in tr translating inputs into outputs and so on. But I think that would be very interesting because at many times what we observe is uh, we have individual level data on bureaucrats. So we know a lot about them, uh, but we cannot map the performance of these individual inputs into individual, uh, they're, they're, we cannot map these individuals into individual performance outcomes. You only have an aggregate outcome. So it's exactly where this type of production function approaches are important. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you everyone for your questions. I think that's um, all of the questions that we've had through. And um, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll call it a day there. Thanks again to Guo for his amazing presentation. Um, it will be available on YouTube after and the link to read and download um, the Voxdev lit, which is now on our website, is in the chat. So if you want to go and read more in depth about um, any of the issues that were covered today, then you can do so at that link. And in the future, that link will also kind of have hopefully some of the updates um, when this literature grows and when there's new insights and evidence that um, Guo and the team have kind of noticed on on bureaucracies in in the developing world. So yeah, I think we'll we'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone. Um, and if there's been a couple more questions through, but I think we can just send them um, maybe through to you, Guo, or sure, yeah, well, then yeah. Happens. Is that is that all right? Um, great. So thank you, everyone, and. Um, yeah, stay tuned to our social media to see when the next launch event is going to be. Right. Thank, Thank you, Gwen.